So the title of our talk is uh, Strategic Collection Management, Finding Creative Solutions to Create Student-Centered Space. And uh, so we all understand that libraries are under increasing pressure to create space while budgets remain tight. And we'd like to talk to you today about some creative solutions from two different perspectives, both from um, both Florida State University and the University of Wisconsin Stout were able to create significant student space through collection management. Um, and what we're gonna do today is begin with FSU's perspective and then we'll turn it over to Corey um, who will share his perspective from Stout. Uh, so here's the contact information um, from FSU. Charles McElroy is gonna get us started and uh, my name is Dan Schoonover. Charles? Good morning, everybody. In the year 2000, we began purchasing JSTOR collections as a means of increasing content. And then as the years passed, it became a means of creating space uh, and a, as the library became more of a place of collaborative study. Uh, the, the head of ILL was a big proponent of, of these purchases to help decrease the number of ILL purchases. And we were able to make the purchases with a combination of funding sources. Um, carry forward and one-time money, carry forward being the money we scoop at the end of the fiscal year for any underspend, and then one-time um, funds can, are discretionary funds from our dean or the, and or the provost. Sorry, thank you. In the spring of, of 2009, in order to free up more space in our stacks, we started to withdraw print duplicates from the JSTOR collections that we owned at the time. And this included our main library, Strozier, our science library, Dirac, and our storage facilities. We had a total of 11 collections for a total of 13, 1,368 titles. We were able to withdraw 758 of these print titles and we gained in the process 610 online titles. The project teams that were working with this project were uh, collect from Collections Access. Dan was the project manager for the Collections Access staff and he had two support staff that, that supervised the project too and also a combination of student assistants and OPS workers. And then from the serials side, which is my group, we had the serials cataloging librarian as our project manager and two, three support staff. The workflow included all the titles that were being withdrawn placed on a spreadsheet and it went from with title, call number, and the volumes per title. We, um, the collections access group compiled all of that information and then gave it to my group. And we made all of our updates, and we were an Olive library, and so we made Olive Holdings updates and OCLT, OCLC updates. And at first, we were deleting all the holdings in our Olive system, and we found out, and you'll see as this progresses, that was a big mistake. So we, um, that was later changed to be withdrawn, so we still had the historical data. And Dan's going to add a little bit more about the OCLC holdings, too, because we ran into a little trouble there. <laughs> um, so the project really kicked off in the summer of 2009. And if we were going to put music with this presentation, this is where it would be kind of dark and scary. Um, the project soon became known to us as JSTORM. We realized we had had good internal communications with our groups and others involved, but we hadn't really communicated out adequately with the academic departments. This resulted in pushback and unhappiness, especially from a few. Um, we had a couple of outspoken faculty members who protested on the principle that we were actually destroying knowledge. After the campus became fully aware of the withdrawals and the com complaints continued to come in, uh, there was an official response from the library. The, we had an open forum in our main library, Strozier, and that included the dean and the associate dean for collections. 
three major points were addressed in this forum. This is what happened. We apologize for what has occurred, and we itemize what we'll do to prevent this from happening again as we go forward. So we worked with the Faculty Senate, and that allowed us to be more transparent and, with their assistance, also re redraft our policy documents. We were still able to complete, completely withdraw 90% of what had been planned, but at this point, as it kicked back in, we had more faculty buy-in and transparency of what was happening. Title lists were distributed to academic departments through our subject librarians, and we allowed faculty members to either, I'm sorry, I forgot to do my, The title lists were then distributed to academic departments through our subject librarians, and we allowed faculty members to either make a case for the libraries to retain the titles, or they could withdraw material, or could request that the withdrawn material be transferred to their de academic department offices. It's several dozen titles were moved back into Strozier, and the holdings reinstated. And this was mostly from classics and art history. Nine volumes had been recycled and needed to be purchased from an out-of-print antiquarian book dealer. Six volumes were returned from a third-party book consignment company that we were working with, and this happened before they had put it in their, on their inventory list, so that was relatively easy to get back. And we also made the promise of timely ILL fulfillments for the mon monographic series and didn't have to replace those. Under our lessons learned, probably the biggest takeaway was with any withdrawal project, we learned the importance of transparency, communication, and engaging faculty. And faculty mostly do want to help. There are just a few outliers that we had to bring on our team. We made sure that we gave adequate information in our distribution of title lists to subject librarians, and we learned to allow for plenty of review time. We used LibGuide to post title list and, and the instructions for claiming materials, as well as withdrawal guidelines for the project. We learned the value of image intensive materials, uh, for example, fold outs and maps, which sometimes don't dig digitize very well. And Subject librarians communicated with departments and offered faculty the opportunity to make a case for retention in the library or to request a property transfer to their departmental reading rooms. Several meetings with the faculty senate helped to craft conversations and announcements to, to ease the transitions. Steps for committee review were put in place by the faculty senate in, in case there was a disagreement between the department or the library regarding a withdrawal cho choice, and this was kind of an arbitration set up, and to my knowledge, we haven't had to use that since this time, and hopefully never will. And to develop clear policies and guidelines for the remainder of the project, to post these clearly for faculty. When all of these remedies were implemented, we things calmed down and we were able to continue with the project and it went well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan. So in 2012, we then conducted a major renovation of the Dirac Science Library. <clears throat> we installed compact shelving on the ground floor, which consolidated three floors of collections into just one which then opened up over 32,000 square feet of floor space for student use. The compact shelving helped, but a lot of weeding was still required. And uh, this picture here shows an area that was once entirely bookshelves. With carryover funds and some other redesignations, we purchased several other JSTOR collections, as well as electronic back files from Wiley, Springer, IEEE, Sage, the American Geophysical Union, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, and the Royal Society of Chemistry. 
and then implementing our lessons from JSTORM, we developed a policy and guidelines document for this specific project, and we posted that document on a LibGuide for faculty review. Also on that LibGuide, we had a clear process for reviewing the items considered for withdrawal, a clear process for actually pulling and withdrawing the items so that the faculty would know exactly what we were going to be doing, which included consignment, um, as well as filling gaps in FLARE, which is the Florida Statewide Storage Facility. And then finally, it included a clear timeline for faculty members to review the title list and then to claim uh, or make a, make a case for titles to be retained by the library or claim them for uh, property transfer to their departments. There were a few critics on campus for this project, but overall we did have faculty support. We were surprised by the uh, math department. They requested that a large amount uh, made a, a very strong case for um, a, a large amount of math titles to be retained in the library. Uh, there was a lot of noise there. Um, in all, we withdrew 578 print titles, um, but we actually gained access to 891 titles by our, the purchase of those print or, or those electronic archives. We did want to note that some OCLC local holdings were not updated during the withdrawal process, which later resulted in an additional project to update our local holdings records with OCLC. In 2017, the space needs persist. Uh, the general collection shelves are at approximately 80% shelving capacity. Special collections is at about 90% capacity. And our two off-site off -site storage facilities are at 100%. The Strozier Library and the Dirac Science Library saw 1.4 million visitors last year. We simply need more seating, more classrooms, and more study, uh, study rooms, group study rooms. These images here are a common sight in Strozier of students on the floor. The library has submitted a master plan to the university, but funding for a new facility is very low on the university's priority list. And so the library administration has recently proposed removing 20,000 square feet of general collection stacks or approximately 35,000 linear feet of books to repurpose that area for other space needs. Although we have a flat budget, we did have a small amount of carry forward money this past year, but more significantly, we received generous one-time funds from the provost who supported our plan for creating more student space. Our dean spent quite a bit of time um, talking with the provost about our space needs and the solutions that purchasing electronic back files can provide. So our strategy to create that 20,000 square feet of student space is one, to purchase more journal back files, and two, to adopt a distributive collection philosophy. Similar to the Dirac project in 2012, we are using one-time money and carry forward money to purchase journal back files. We recently purchased JSTOR 14 and 15, and we're also going to be pulling from the shelves all of the volumes that the moving wall in JSTOR um, from, from previous collections. Uh, we are also purchasing back files for Wiley, Springer, APA, Taylor & Francis, Nature, and ProQuest periodicals online. We did immediately remove titles from the withdrawal list that had previously been requested for retention by faculty members from previous JSTOR collections or identified as image intensive by our librarians. The librarians were given six weeks to review the title lists, and then the lists were posted on a LibGuide for faculty to review for six weeks. The LibGuide also included a rationale for the project, instructions on how to claim materials, and a copy of the withdrawal guidelines. In total, we picked up 3,105 titles from these back files, and we estimate that we will remove approximately 13,000 linear feet of collections uh, from the shelves. In addition, we've adopted a distributive collection man man management philosophy, and by that, what I mean is we recognize it is not sustainable for libraries to collect everything. When it comes to general scholarly books and journals, what a library has access to, whether owned or not, has the most relevance to students and faculty. And we also believe that maintaining print collections is a long-term multi-institutional responsibility. 
and that we can rely on print retentions of others for access and to reduce duplication. In regards to ACERL Scholars Trust, we are beginning to deduplicate STEM journal holdings represented in the Cooperative Journal Retention Program, and we will soon be submitting our arts and humanities commitments, um, uh, and we're looking forward to that. Uh, we recently joined the second cohort of EAST, the Eastern Academic Scholars Trust, and are still in the data analysis phase. Participating libraries will make monograph um, uh, uh, retention commitments after a collection analysis with Green Glass. We did get our first look at Green Glass um, just recently, and uh, the first report that our collection manager played with was uh, those books in the public domain that are duplicated in Hathi Trust, nearly 77,000 items in our collection, or 7% of our collection. Uh, the report also shows our circulation records as well as retention commitments by other universities. Um, so we're, we're excited about Green Glass and East and, and the, the, the potential that those have for us um, in, in our being strategic with our collection management. One challenge to moving to a distributive model is making sure that resource sharing policies are generous. If we're going to depend on each other for access to certain content, then that content needs to be seamlessly accessible and for a long enough period of time. In conclusion, um, of the uh, FSU perspective, uh, purchasing journal back files and relying on the retention commitments of others has allowed us um, to complete several major renovations. These pictures here show space in Strozier Library, where again, there was once only book stacks. We've learned a lot about transparency and collegiality along the way. Uh, and since 2000, we have gained a, an access, a total access of 8,449 titles in these electronic back files. And uh, while creating uh, and about to create in total 53,000 square feet of student space. And now I turn it over to Corey uh, so we can hear from the University of Wisconsin. Thanks, Dan. I'm gonna set my uh, timer here because I've been known to talk a lot, so I got, we wanted to leave a little bit of time at the end of our session for you to ask some questions. Um, so getting into, which one is the green? <laughs> the green one right in the middle. Um, getting into Stout's um, perspective on this whole process, uh, we would undertook slightly different um, process than Florida State, um, slightly different institutions, different sizes. This is a picture of me from like 13 years ago, so yes, this is the same guy. Um, you know how that is, sometimes you get that picture right when you start working and then it's, it's still out there. Um, so my name is Corey Mitchell, I'm the Head of Collection Development at the University of Wisconsin Stout. Um, we are uh, a member of the University of Wisconsin system. Um, you know, everybody probably knows about Madison, um, that's the flagship, that's the big dog, big dog. and we're, we're a smaller institution, our FTE, I just wanted to give you some stats on that, about 7,800 FTE, um, 9,700 9, total enrollment, and there you see some of our statistics. One of the things that makes us unique in, the, um, in Wisconsin is that we are designated Wisconsin's Polytechnic University. So we got a polytechnic focus, which means we have a lot of unique kind of programs. And some of these unique programs is what's driven some of our space needs. Um, we have a large game de development and design program, which allowed us to create a gaming lab. We have a large, um, we have a comics and graphic novel concentration in an entertainment design major that allowed us to create this comics maker space, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And we are also a laptop campus. So what that means is all our undergraduate students receive a laptop, and also not just a laptop, but technology associated with it. So technology is really important to us. And um, our collection management philosophy has changed um, somewhat since we got that designation. Um, this is my collection Snapchat, just to give you a little perspective. Um, it's kind of funny, I was talking to Dan and I asked how many volumes they had, and of course they had a lot. Um, we have about 200,000 um, physical volumes still. Um, but you can see we do a lot of action in the e-realm. The e so I have about 500,000 um, e-books available. Um, we only have 7,000 um, um, physical um, audiovisual, but we have 125,000 streaming videos. So you kind of see that that's the direction we're going. And that kind of shows what we're doing um, and wh why these projects are important to us. Um, P versus E, that's kind of my breakdown. Um, this is an analysis I did last year. Um, so right now, my holdings, 
I would, I would estimate 72% electronic and 28% print. So we still have print, but that's really driving a lot of our, our, what we're doing at Stout. Um, and it kind of matches my spend. So I have 88% electronic, and I spell, spent, still spend 12% on print. So why is that important? While our, our overall physical collection is shrinking, we have these, I call these specialty collections. So our comics and graphic novels collection is growing. Um, it started three years ago. It's only up to 1,500 volumes, but is one of our growing collections. And in the future, I see it um, being much larger than that. So I wanted to really create space um, for the students to get in front of that. The video game collection is the same thing. Um, it's one of our physical collections that are growing. And of course, we have the Education Materials Center. That's a very important curriculum collection in our library, and it has high use. So what are all these collections in common? Is you can see, they all have high use. And because of Stout's unique um, polytechnic nature, they actually are curriculum based and they're not just for entertainment. The entertainment piece is, is, is a nice um, extra thing, but it's not why we do it. Um, why do we do all this? Um, this, this term, collaborative collection spaces. So what I mean by that is I wanted to create spaces in my library where the collections um, are right next to where you collaborate or create things. So the comics books right there, and then inside, you'll see my pictures coming up, we have the, the comic artists creating things. So they have access to the collection, and right there, they are um, doing work and creating things and studying in the same way with the Education Materials Center. So we have students um, that are working on lesson plans. They have access to those children's books and the other curriculum materials that they need right there in building. So we wanted to create those kinds of spaces. We wanted to create um, inviting student spaces. You want to get people in the door, right? People might be coming in the door, they might not. So you got to give them spaces to do that. So that was a part of this. We also wanted to make um, increased use of library materials. I mean, that's why we're here, to, to create use. So we did that as well. And then move some of the higher use collections from the fourth floor down to the first floor. That was a big driver in all this, too. So one of the things uh, that I, when I first proposed this, the shoestring budget. I had no budget, <laughs> a very minimal budget. We did have a little bit of budget for staffing. That's it. So we had to be very creative in how we solved our problems. Um, and so that was a really key component of this whole thing. We really had no money to do this other than staff time. And I'll show the impact um, with some numbers. So there was a lot of staff time dedicated to that. And that, of course, is money. But I had no really additional money to to help me complete this project. So we had to reuse furniture. So I don't know if it's what it's like in your library, but in my library we have um, furniture from five different decades that are all over the building in different areas. They're kind of all mixed in. So one of the things we wanted to do was reuse the furniture, create groupings where the newer stuff was together and some of the older stuff was together so the old stuff wasn't interspersed throughout, throughout everything. Um, Multifunction study spaces. Um, so what I mean by that is, and I'm sure this happens in your library too, I wanted to create spaces that were, were for group study, for individual study, for, um, for, create, for creating um, graphic novels, um, for um, beanbag chairs for comfort, regular tables, furniture that moves around so students can use the space how they want. We kind of dictate how the spaces are set up but we really want them to use it for how they need it. So that's the creative, and then also creative use of shelves. <laughs> You'll see what I'm talking about coming up. We used actual shelving to build um, walls um, in one part, and we used that, so you'll see what that. And we did buy a few things, beanbag chairs, um, we could get approved, and some drafting tables for the comics and graphic novels makerspace area um, for the artists. Um, so the weeding details. So what drove this whole thing is we had our periodicals on second floor. They took up a huge um, amount of space in our library. So we undertook this process. We got rid of 1,500 titles, okay? And I think I only have like 500 titles left. 65% um, of my physical periodicals were weeded, gone. Um, that cleared up 5,670 um, feet of linear shelf space. So starting this project, we had about 7,000 feet. <laughs> so you can see what we have left. Um, so we weeded that 5,670 feet, and we left with only about 2,000 feet left. We got rid of Eric. Um, we should have done that a long time ago, but that was part of this process. And then we also got rid of um, a bunch of microfiche and cabinets. So that also cleared up 
um, floor space, which that stuff could have been done. It made it somewhat easy because we did have to take care of that. Um, those were easy, easy things to pick. Um, but here we go, the collection move. So these are all the things that we got done in our timeline. We, we moved the Education Materials Center into new space on second floor. Um, we created that comics and graphic novels make, maker space on second floor. We moved our popular books and audio books from the fourth floor to the first floor. Our movies and TV collection, we moved from the fourth floor to the first floor. We created a new collection, documentaries and nonfiction videos. Previously, that stuff was interspersed throughout the whole library. So we created that, moved that, moved that down to the first floor. And we moved our video games to the first floor. And we actually moved the current periodicals up to the second floor where the other periodicals were. Project timeline. Let me see where I'm at on time. I'm actually not doing as bad as when I practiced earlier. Um, project timeline. So we did all this in nine months. So kind of get perspective on that. Nine months. It was a tight timeline. So it, we had to be very flexible, very nimble. Things came up that I could not have anticipated that I had to take care of. Um, the initial planning was a couple months. And then we did implementation, you know, and then for, for months, you know, a couple months there. And then we had completion finally in, um, in August of this year. So we kind of just start, started in December and ended in August. And we're still not 100% done, so that's part of this process thing. We're not all the way done, but we're, we're pretty close, so we call, it, we call it done. So what we learned, some of the stuff um, that Florida State talked about was, was, was key for us too. Communication, I mean, these are, some of these are kind of no-brainers. Like, oh, Corey, how'd you come up with these? I mean, they're not, they're not rocket science, um, but from our perspective, they were some of the things that came to the top. Communication is key. I mean, come on, let's be honest, it is. Everything we did there affected every unit in the entire library. So we had to be very transparent of our process. Now, I will say we weren't always the best at communication. So my recommendation, if you undertake some kind of in processes like this, is to be as transparent as possible. But that said, there are things that you have to make snap decisions on that might affect a certain unit, or we have to get this done under this timeline. Um, that, you know, then you have to kind of do damage control, and that, that's going to happen. But the more open you are, the better it is. Um, planning and, and deadlines. <laughs> I kind of laugh at this one. Um, because I think Florida State probably had a much more planned out process in how they had to do it. Um, me and at Stout is more kind of by the, the seat of our pants. We kind of had, hey, we want to get this done by July 1st, okay? Here are some very general deadlines. Here are some very general planning. Let's make it happen. There's a, there's a plus side and a minus side. The plus side is that allows you to be more nimble, in my opinion. I didn't have all these hard deadlines that, oh, we got to get this done by this day. Oh, my God, we, did, we couldn't figure that out. So that screwed this up. So that did help us. On the flip side, there's things that came up that were just like, okay, how are we going to do this now? It all worked out. So... Um, that's kind of one of those things. It's kind of a judgment call. So I would say do what's necessary, but don't overdo it. Sometimes um, paralysis by analysis can take place if you overplan. Um, we had an outside inside project manager process. So I was the outside project manager. And I, I don't mean outside of the library. I mean, I was kind of like the head project manager. And then I had two gentlemen um, that were working with me that did a lot of the nitty gritty details, a lot of the hard work. Um, and that worked very well for us because I could have kind of have the idea like, hey, we need to get this done. I could tell Paul and Patty, I'm like, hey, I need this done. You guys work out some of the details, you get it figured out, and that worked well because I still had all my same duties I had to still do. You know, I couldn't just stop what I was doing. Um, outside collaborations can help. So we had a couple of outside collaborations with different departments um, to come, with, come up with ideas for the space. So the School of Art and Design was instrumental in helping us plan for this comics um, maker space. Um, the education, School of Education was important to help plan the Education Materials Center space. So please, you know, use leverage those when you can. Um, flexibility is, uh, is essential. So you have to be flexible, you have to be nimble. I already talked about that. Institutional effort required, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And I, I want to pick up my pace just a little bit so I have time to show you all my slides. And be gracious and appreciative. That was one of the biggest things. You know, we're asking people to do a lot of things on, on our behalf for the benefit of all students at Stout, right? But it, it comes off like, oh, Corey needs me to do this, Corey, you know. But if you're really appreciative and, you know, thankful, people, it goes a long way. And then teamwork, of course, is key. 
I talked about those collaborations already, so I'm gonna move on to the next one. Some of the challenges we had, time. Takes a lot of time. A lot of my time was dedicated to this. A lot of staff time was dedicated to this. And I'll show that in a little bit. Expectations, you need to have realistic expectations. And that's not only my expectations for the project, that's my boss's expectations to the project, all the way up like to the provost or whatever level it goes. So expectations are key. Always many moving parts. Like, I couldn't even write down all the parts, like how many moving parts there were. So you always just have to, things flow, you have to be flexible, that's key to any project like this. Project management experience, yes, I could have benefited from a class on this. Never had a class on project management. Collection development librarians have to do project management things all the time, but you know, maybe if you had library schools, I don't know if they're doing that now, but project management is key to success here. Um, priorities, you gotta have priorities. We need to get this thing done by July 1st. This has to be done. So then that kind of drives what you're doing. There is plenty of obstacles, okay? They're not all bad and they're not all, like, couldn't overcome, but something would pop up and you'd have to address it. Library units involved, you can see all the different library units involved at Stout. These are basically every single one of the library units at Stout. They're all involved in some way. Um, so I kind of threw up some numbers there. Nine, so student hours, so we had a lot of student hours to help with this. So you can almost see 10,000 student hours were used. We had about 900 or 860 um, library support staff hours, and I didn't even um, put in the librarian hour, hours. They were significant. My hours, um, the, collect, the cataloging librarian, the education materials center librarian, and the technology librarian. So many, many hours were put in this project. Future directions um, is to finish off the new spaces. So we, and all during this whole process, I have a new boss. So right in the middle of the process, we were hiring a new library director, and it was just like, this is insane, because it's like, I don't know when he, if he comes in, he's gonna wanna change things. So that was also kind of driving a little bit about what we were doing. We we're like, we need to have this thing almost done when he comes in, because we wanna say, hey, look what, look what we can do. So that was kind of interesting too. Um, the Arts Integration Menominee Project um, is also a part of this. So as we're looking at this space, we had this outside collaboration. Um, they got a grant to work with the community and students and to do things like murals and things. So we had all these walls in the space. So they're gonna do a really nice mural for us. They're gonna create um, different mosaic um, sculptures and all kinds of stuff, which is very cool. And that stuff, we don't have to pay for. They're gonna do it as part of their grant. But that would have never happened if we wouldn't have done any of this, um, this project. So we need to finish up the, we are also weeding the main collection at this time. <laughs> so I need to finish that in this whole, whole process. And we need to assess the spaces and the uses. I mean, we really just kicked off the spaces in September, um, and so, there, so we haven't done any assessments, so that's key. We wanna assess, hey, did what we did actually mean anything or not? So I'm really close, and I'm actually a little bit over, so I'm gonna fly through um, my slides here at the end, but I kinda wanted to give you a visual, kinda like start to finish um, of some of the things. So let's just get, get to that. This is right away, um, this is what the periodicals room look like. So you can kind of look down the vision. This is actually, we shifted at this point. So this wasn't a before thing, but this is what the room looked like. You can kind of see. So you can kind of see where we're going with this. This is us um, after we cleared out a bunch of shelves. So we had those periodical shelves from wall to wall in that room. And this is us clearing it out. And you can see we're stacking the shelves there. There's more. You don't think of this, but where do all those shelves have to go? <laughs> That was something we had to solve. So we kind of we kind of had a spot where we put them, but then I had to figure out, okay, I got to talk to my surplus guys. We got to figure out how to move these things because we don't need them all. Okay, so we had to figure out that process, and we did figure it out. But this is building the new shelves in the EMC area. So we're moving the, the, the some of the books up. And you can kind of see the process there. This is the old periodicals area as they're getting shifted and pushed back. This is just. You can see we just had to have stuff kind of stacked up in different places. Um, a lot of this happened over the summer, so it wasn't that big of a deal. Um, here's my man, Patty. Um, Patrick Gallagher, he was one of my inside project managers, and he's building these um, comics walls, these shelf walls. So we used the shelves themselves 
to create like a wall. And we put the collection on the outside of the shelves. And then on the inside, we have the comics maker space. And you'll see a picture of that later. But there's him doing that. There's, you can see the walls being built using the shelves creatively to solve, solve our problems because we had no money. This is, I wanted to highlight this as a student um, worker. They were essential to the project. You saw they almost put in 9,000 hours or more than 9,000 hours. So without them, we could not have done this. So they're on first floor now building shelves. So as we're moving things down on the first floor, this is the EMC before we moved it. And I kind of want to highlight it's a really cramped space and didn't work for them. So we moved that up into a much better space. This is that same area I just showed you. Um, that's Paul, um, the gentleman there, um, and the student worker. And this is um, them busting down the shelves in that same area. So this is like after they broke it all down. You can imagine the, the time involved with this. This is just that area cleared out. So now this is first floor in the reference area now. So now all this space was freed up. Um, this is also the first floor, one of the things um, you know, you don't think of really when you're doing a project like this, but we had to stack furniture somewhere. And then another thing I didn't think about, we had to um, have the custodians clean the carpets. Because you imagine these shelves have been up for 20 years or so. They've never cleaned, you know, they don't every year get to lift up the shelves and, 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 and clean under, under them. So I had to like, I had to put that in my process. I didn't even think of it. I'm like, oh yeah, we're gonna, we want them to wash the carpets, right? So then we had to work that into the process too. This is just our microfiche before we weeded it. Um, this is filling the shelves on first floor. So this is as, so this stuff is all kind of happening at the same time. I mean, it goes in stages, but it, it does happen there. There's the display periodicals on second floor. So we put those up by the, that's the comics. So that's the outside wall now of the comics uh, and the picture on the right. This is important. <laughs> I know, wow, recycling and disposal. Why is this so important? So I just want to show you a little bit about this process here. And I know I'm almost at my limit. I'm way over time. Um, but we, we, had a, we had an intense recycling and disposal process. On the left-hand side, that's microfiche. That huge thing is full 100% with microfiche. But we had to test to make sure that we could throw it out. Okay, so we had to have a, t a process to do that. And then the thing on the right is the bins. So unfortunately, we couldn't recycle those because they had metal in there or something. But this blue one is, is a recycling um, thing that we did. And that, that is, now this is going to freak you out, but those are all journals on the right-hand side. Okay, so this thing, I got some statistics here um, from Patrick. This thing was tipped 99 times. Okay, so that thing was full to the brim 99 times. And um, <laughs> Patrick put this together for me. He said, we re when we recycled, we saved 505 trees, 118,000 kilowatts of electricity, 210,000 210, gallons of water, and you know, 1,800 pounds of air pollution. So we had to work with our um, people on campus um, to make sure that this was all happening. So this is another thing you don't really think of. Okay, what are we gonna do with all this stuff? Well, for us, we, we got rid of We recycled a lot of it. This is the new EMC space on the second floor. So you can see it's much more open, nicer, much more use, used by the students in the education areas um, and, and gave them a lot more space. OK, this is a story time space that Kate, who's the EMC librarian, really wanted, a nice story time space. So, so we made one for her there. Um, the new maker space. So here's that comic space. So here's the walls on the outside. And this is the inside. So on the inside, we have different areas. We have like a, um, you know, a guillotine cutter. Okay, we have drafting tables for the, for the artists to use, a guillotine cutter, and we set up different spaces. You can see the, the variance in furniture, right? Because we had to do it on a shoestring budget. So we didn't have $10,000 or even 1,000. We had, well, we spent about $1,000 on furniture, roughly. That's it, though. Um, and here's the space, the in-between space. So we wanted the space to have a flow area. And here's what the old periodicals are left with. So you can see that number along the top there, 14. So it used to, the, the, it used to be 88 you know, down at the other end. So now we're down to only 14 of those shelves left. And there's a, more I can talk about, but I went way over my time limit. So um, I believe we only have two minutes for questions. So sorry about that. but. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah.
Like, what did we learn of, of our process or how did we make our decisions? So actually for the comics area, I went into the, the Ursula is one of our um, uh, a faculty member in the art department. And I went in there and I said, hey, if you guys could have a perfect maker space, what do you want? And they came up with, I don't have it in there, but they came up with this. And then we just took this and on a shoestring budget, we tried to do some of what they needed. So that was for that space. For the Education Materials Center, um, the, that librarian met with the faculty and said, what am, what, am I, what am I missing, what do I need? And then part of it was just, we need to make the space more inviting, more seating, and things like that. So one of the things I didn't talk about at all was ADA requirements. So with our shelves, you didn't see it, but Patty, Literally, we put little pieces of tape where we wanted to put the shelves up before we built them. And we measured every single thing to make sure they were ADA compliant. And I'll be honest right now, I can't remember the inches it needs to be, um, the minimums, but we actually went to the maximum. And that was like a huge process to do that. So if you're doing any kind of project like that, I'd recommend doing that. And we actually literally laid out tape and taped out what it looked like. Because you can imagine if you build something to tear it down and rebuild it would be very difficult. <laughs> so, thanks. And I'm sorry, but it, it's at the time. But if you got another question, sure. Yeah, I have a question for the gentleman from Florida State. Uh, it sounded like you were giving faculty the opportunity to keep the monographs and materials that you were designing. Um, what's the follow-up on that? Are, are they asking for it? Are, are you seeing them re-coming back across the circulation desk? And how are you marketing it to make sure you're not seeing them? Uh, I, I would say that the request, as, as, as we've continued with multiple projects, the request to retain or to transfer property to their departments is, is much less. Um, the projects in 2010 and 2012, there were quite a few requests. And what I have heard is that many of those JSTOR volumes are still in boxes in their department offices. Uh, this recent project in 2017, um, very, very few requests. Uh, none to retain in, in, in the library by faculty. Uh, we've, our, our arts librarian um, has requested that a number of, of very um, image intensive volumes stay in the library. But as far as faculty members, um, may, maybe half a dozen uh, requests uh, to transfer to their department. And we, we need to wrap up. So, thank you. <laughs>